Hi, and welcome to Different Leaf, a show for new and experienced cannabis consumers. I'm Britt Smith. Back in the 70s, one of the first academics in America to propose that cannabis might be a good medicine was Harvard psychiatry professor Dr. Lester Grinspoon. In the late 60s, Lester had shared a joint with his colleague in the astronomy department, Dr. Carl Sagan. And by 1971, Lester had published a groundbreaking book called Marijuana Reconsidered. Lester's book was the first intellectual look at the research on cannabis as medicine, and it concluded, controversially, that it was a relatively safe intoxicant that should be regulated like alcohol. Of course, Dr. Lester Grinspoon's research deeply angered then-President Nixon, who ramped up the war on drugs, and Dr. Lester Grinspoon quickly became the scholarly face of the legalization movement. Fifty some odd years later, Lester's son, Dr. Peter Grinspoon, has picked up the torch and become one of the leading expert voices on the efficacy of medical marijuana. Peter Grinspoon, who is our guest today, followed in his father's footsteps and studied at Harvard, where he became a primary care physician and later an instructor at Harvard Medical School. He's now a cannabis specialist at Massachusetts General Hospital, and he's the author of the new book, which drops on 420, Seeing Through the Smoke, a Cannabis Specialist Untangles the Truth About Marijuana. Peter's new book continues some of what his father started in Marijuana Reconsidered by taking a modern analytical scholarly review of the world's cannabis research to date, and it discusses the known benefits and harms of the plant as medicine. In this information-packed episode, we're going to delve into what it was like for Peter growing up in the Grinspoon family, surrounded by intellectuals at home who were discussing the potentials of cannabis as medicine, and even watching his own brother use cannabis to help with the side effects of chemotherapy, while at the same time being taught the dangers of his brain on drugs at school. We'll also get into the topics that Dr. Grinspoon covers in his new book, like how cannabis works for pain, sleep, and PTSD, and we'll dive deeper into his chapters on cannabis and psychosis, cannabis and addiction, and cannabis and autism. If you have it handy, grab your copy of the winter 2023 issue of Different Leaf the magazine and flip to page 44 to get a sneak peek at Dr. Grinspoon's book. If you don't have your issue yet, you can always order it online or find your local retailer at differentleaf.com. And we'll be right back with cannabis specialist and author, Dr. Peter Grinspoon. Thank you, as always, for joining us, Dr. Peter Grinspoon. Today, we're going to be talking about your new book, Seeing Through the Smoke, A Cannabis Specialist Untangles the Truth About Marijuana. Lucky for us at Different Leaf, we've actually got an excerpt of the book, which is not coming out until 420, 2023. And I've actually been able to not just read through the excerpt, but read through a lot of the book, too. And it is fascinating. Before we dive into it, though, <laughs> let's talk about the prologue, which made me cry, about your family. Can you give us a bit of background about Danny and Lester and the story of your family in cannabis? Uh, absolutely. I mean, you know, anybody in the cannabis world knows my dad because he was a very legendary scientist and advocate. But what they might not know is that the first thing that happened to get me interested in cannabis sort of professionally happened when I was just a little kid. And I started off the book talking about that, which is that my brother Danny, who was about six years older than me, was fighting an unsuccessful battle against childhood leukemia. And my parents, right in the early 1970s, right when Nixon was starting his war on drugs, they illegally procured cannabis for him because they had heard that it could really help alleviate some of the worst symptoms of chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting. And it was just amazing when Danny smoked a little bit, he wanted to eat on the way home from the hospital. He'd be downstairs playing with his boisterous little twin brothers. And when he didn't use cannabis, he'd be like lying in his bed, you know, barfing and lying in the dark with a towel over his head. Like, you know, obviously his little brothers like the on-cannabis Danny better than the off-cannabis Danny because he played with us. And I saw at such an early age how impactful cannabis can be as a medicine. You know, it's as I talk about in the book, it's certainly not a cure-all and it doesn't treat everything and it doesn't work for everybody. But I saw like direct, absolute evidence. I mean, there's very little that's more impactful than seeing a family member have their suffering alleviated. So 
I knew all along the cannabis was a medicine. You know, people could debate for what, you know, is it better or worse than this or that. But so I was immune to all the absolute nonsense that they teach us in medical school about cannabis. You know, that's slowly, slowly changing about 25 years later, but they still only teach the endocannabinoid system in about 13% of medical schools. So, but, you know, I was an advocate, you know, I was really interested. And then the other part is just because my dad was such a scholar in cannabis, we always had, you know, these most, the most incredible people visiting and, and talking and they'd have these really engaging, inspiring sort of cannabis infused conversation. And, you know, I really began to associate cannabis with like good, good humor and, human connection and interaction and sort of as an intellectual stimulant and everybody was laughing and, you know, the discussions were just fascinating and all kinds of like intellectuals and luminaries were sort of gathered around the hookah, so to speak. And, you know, then I'd go to school, like middle school or high school and, you know, the same old policeman would come in every year and say, cannabis makes you a motivational. And it's like, I was just like, who was motivational? Who wasn't motivational? Like I knew that they were lying and it was very confusing. You know, it got less confusing as I got older. I was like, they're lying. But when I was younger, it was actually really confusing. There was this cognitive dissonance between the like intense motivation that cannabis was causing at home and like this stale message they kept giving us at school. So eventually yeah. I figured it out and I'm still trying to figure it out with the book. You know, a lot of it's like a quicksand. It's very complicated. But those two things, my, my brother's illness and my dad's scholarship really got me interested in this. And I've been practicing it since like day one as a doctor. And your dad's really, his book, Marijuana Reconsidered in the 70s, laid the groundwork, not just for you, but for all of medical marijuana. I mean, it was the first intellectual look at cannabis as a plant medicine. And now in this book, you've gone into detail about sort of what came from that era of questioning. Is cannabis really bad for you? I know that Nixon started a whole war on drugs on it, but you're, what your dad was seeing at home with his son was obviously very moving for him as a doctor, as somebody who was practicing psychiatry and trying to understand the human mind and, and trying to understand the human health and body. And he was seeing his son obviously feeling much better with cannabis use. For you writing this book that really summarizes and analyzes the positive and negative views of cannabis that must have been what you were seeing at that time with the, you know, the police officers, they're pushing that this is really dangerous and sort of egg frying your brain. Meanwhile, your father and family were showing you that it was medical. And in this book, you've argued those two paths. You're looking at both the for and the against of cannabis, the, the very far ends of them, and looking into their claims and analyzing with evidence, like what really is the truth here. So I'm going to give you a bit of a quick fire, but from what we know, is it true that cannabis helps pain, sleep, PTSD, autism, all these different things? Well, pain and sleep, absolutely unquestionable. Like it's silly to even be discussing it. PTSD, the veterans swear by it. We don't have a lot of the kind of data that doctors like to look at the randomized controlled trials. But it's just hard to imagine that like literally millions of veterans say this works and nothing else works. I have a lot of patients who are veterans. So I'm convinced for PTSD, you know, again, not for everybody. You know, some of the data was a little bit contradictory. Some of it made some symptoms worse, some made some symptoms better. But overall, I think it's going to be a huge component of our, our efforts going forward. Aside, You know, in addition to like MDMA assisted therapy and all that stuff for treating people with mm. PTSD. And then autism, I started writing the chapter thinking, we don't really know if it helps with autism. And then I like ended the chapter after reading everything, thinking, wow, this is really, really intriguing. I can't believe the medical community isn't throwing everything into studying this. There's like enough hmm. smoke that we should be studying it like number one, two, and three. So I was really sort of surprised how much more evidence for autism there was than I thought and how little it's sort of being responded to by the mainstream medical community. Wow. And then on the flip side, when folks are really concerned about it and think that it's like the devil's lettuce, you know, is it is it really the worst thing you can do before driving? Is it really bad for teenagers? Is it really bad for pregnant women? Well, the thing is, it depends a little bit on your vantage point is what I've learned. I mean, if you're like a, a pediatric psychiatrist and you see 
those kids that do use it and have psychosis, you're against it. If you're someone in the ER that sees a lot of cannabis hyperemesis, you might be against it. If you're an oncologist and you see how much it benefits people, something like 90% of oncologists are in favor of it. So it depends a little bit on your vantage point. But I'd say like any other drug or medicine, it has its harms, it has its benefits, and it could use be used more or less safely and wisely. Um, you know, driving, it's definitely more dangerous to drive stoned than it is to drive sober, but it's mm. much safer to drive stoned than it is to drive drunk, though I don't recommend doing either. You know, and it's all a question of sort of the context, you know, like a college student that takes a huge dose once will be super stoned and impaired. A medical cannabis patient who takes a small puff twice a day just to alleviate symptoms with some CBD in it year after year, they're not going to be particularly impaired. So it really depends, you know, the person, the other drugs you're on, how good a driver you are, how often you use cannabis, how experienced you are. So you can't just say yes or no to these questions. But what I conclude is that it's basically unethical to drive impaired on anything. Though there is an interesting part in that chapter about how much SSRIs, antidepressants, muscle relaxants, the Ambien's, the gabapentins, all these other drugs, the benzodiazepines that we that people take all day left and right before driving uh, aren't questioned. And cannabis is no more dangerous than any of those. So I think we shouldn't have a double standard for cannabis. And either you shouldn't take anything before driving or you could take your medical marijuana if you could take your opiates and your benzos and your gabapentins. I don't think it's any more impairing. But in short, I recommend it against driving under the influence of cannabis, just because you're not just taking a risk yourself, you're risking other people. And the crash risk Mm. does go up and it's just not ethical to put other people in that position. And then the other one you asked me about teenagers, does it hurt their brains? That's very complicated. And in pregnancy, we'll start with pregnancy. As a primary care doctor, I'm cautious about everything in pregnancy because our first mandate is to do no harm. So I recommend against using medical cannabis, except in certain cases, such as hyperemesis, gravidarum, where you're barfing and you can't stop barfing. And like the intravenous medications they give you in the hospital, like aren't necessarily that much safer than cannabis would be. And then, you know, there's also the issue, like if you're pregnant, you're a woman and you're suffering from anxiety or depression or pain or insomnia, you have to take something. You can't just suffer. So we don't know how dangerous cannabis is during pregnancy. As a primary care doctor, things are guilty until proven innocent. Yet at the same time, people have suffering that needs to be alleviated. So I tried in my book to sort of contextualize just how dangerous we think cannabis is so that if people need it, they know what kind of risk they're going to be taking. (laughs) That was an incredible wrap up on some of the subject, just some of the subjects that are covered in this book. Why do you think it is that we still think so, so very differently about this? As, as you've put it in the book, there's like the canatopians who think this is the, the <laughs> magical medical plant. You know? And then there's the reefer pessimists who think that it's the devil's lettuce and it's a terrible thing for anybody to even try and use and, and that it's unethical to use as a medicine. I mean, it's got to be because of the war on drugs, the culture that we're all being brought up in, right? It's it's just generational differences in how we're looking at this plant. Well, the war on drugs was obviously a huge component of what, why we have two different opinions on this. And there was a lot of disinformation, particularly promulgated by the US government. And then people get into their echo chambers, like the psychiatrists, you know, I uh, subscribe to the American Society of Addiction Medicine newsletter, and like, there's only negative articles about cannabis. There's never a positive article about cannabis. Hmm. It's literally this echo chamber Uh, Not to pick on those guys. They do a great job on the opiates and with the other things. But I I just don't think the addiction people, and I have a whole chapter about this, have got cannabis right at all. They just don't understand it. So they get started with the war on drugs and a lot of disinformation. And then this sort of became perpetuated by these echo chambers. And also, frankly, money is a lot of it. The law enforcement, the alcohol industry, now they're more like, if we can't beat it, join it. But they've been against the legalization referendums, big pharma, the rehab industry can't stand legalization. They get about half of their their referrals for cannabis just by the court saying, you know, they go to the parents, would you rather go to jail, your kid go to juvie or or go to rehab? And the parents, of course, say rehab and they call it cannabis addiction. It's not really cannabis addiction. It's caught with cannabis, busted and trying to get out of trouble. It's not cannabis addiction. So there's right. all kinds of factors, uh, financial, that have perpetuated this. And then finally, there's the cultural aspects, which sort of got deepened during the 1960s. It became associated with like the left and the counterculture. And I think that sort of further put a wedge between the two sides. 
Yeah. Oh, that goes deep, right? And now, how do we find a middle ground now through such political polarization? And folks like to stick to what their side believes about certain topics. Oftentimes, no questions asked. Do you think that the only way that we can find a real common ground here on whether or not to have access to cannabis is to legalize, do the research and see what comes of it? Or do you think that's too big of a gamble? Well, no matter what you think of cannabis, the, the war on drugs has been a failure. So it needs to be legalized. There are many different ways it could be legalized. It could be safely and sensibly regulated or it could be a complete free for all. I mean, I'm really in favor of having it be sensibly regulated, but uh, keeping it illegal does, it causes much more harm than good. I mean, there are very few people these days that still believe in putting people in cages for freezing cannabis. I mean, it's a medicinal plant that's a lot safer than many of the pharmaceuticals that we prescribe. And it's just astounding that anybody would get in trouble. So I think criminalization should just be off the table. But the question is how to get both sides more on the same page. Mm -hmm. I did talk about how cannabis makes you forget, which is a side effect. It could affect your short-term <laughs> memory. But it's also a benefit. Michael Pollan in his book, the botany of the desire talked about how cannabis helping us forget is like a critical part of our brain because if you remember like every face on the bus this morning, your brain would so quickly overload and shut down. Like we need to forget and cannabis helps us do that. And in some ways forgetting is as important as remembering. And then, you know, that's sort of a launching point where I talk about how both sides need to forget sort of the past and start from fresh. I mean, the pro-cannabis mm. people are so conditioned because there have been so many lies and so many bogus studies about how negative cannabis is that they just reject any study that suggests harms, which is very dangerous. I mean, of course, cannabis has harms. Every drug, every medicine has harms. And I think the pro-cannabis people have to realize that like things are changing. There's more balanced. There's more research on both sides. There's more funding for benefits. And they have to like look at each study with fresh eyes, like, this is really show a harm or is the same this is the same sort of drug war nonsense and you know there's a lot of both and you have to really do cut through a lot of nonsense but you have to just get over the fact that the government was lying about it for 50 years and not just immediately reject any suggestion of harm i mean it's just common sense and the psychedelics people they're not just saying there aren't any harms they're really mindfully looking at the harms and the benefits. And we need to do the same with cannabis. And then for the people mm -hmm. who are anti-cannabis, you know, we've been sold a bill of goods about cannabis. The Americans have realized that we've been flat out lied about it for the last 50 years. 94% of Americans support legal access to medical cannabis. I mean, name anything else that 94% of Americans agree on. They can't even <laughs> agree that the sky is blue at this point. I mean, who would have thought the cannabis would be the great uniter? But, you know, the anti-side has to get with the program because they're getting outvoted. They're being sort of ignored and not listened to. And I think they need to really learn about the endocannabinoid system Forget, again, it's about forgetting, forget all the nonsense that they would, were taught and really to the extent possible, start over with a fresh look at this and say, why are so many patients saying that it helps? And, you know, looking at studies from outside the U.S., not just the little echo chamber of U.S. medicine, which is very controlled by the American Medical Association and the American Psychiatric Association, like really looking at what they're doing in Europe, in Canada, in Israel. I mean, there's all this great research all over the world. And interestingly, the two sides are coming closer together. It's just happening a lot more slowly than it ought to be happening. I mean, I think mm -hmm. that the pro people are realizing that it does have some harms. You know, they see kids taking gummies and ending up in the ER and they see that people are getting hyperemesis. Like, obviously, there are some harms of cannabis that we, and it just means that there are safer and less safe ways of using it. And I think the anti people are just like, nobody listens to you if you still put medical marijuana in quotation marks. I mean, then you've like defined yourself <laughs> as like a fundamentalist that no one's going to listen to. And I think that really does a disservice to patients because when doctors act like that and they have a very snooty and dismissive attitude towards patients, patients just don't bring it up. I've taken care of so many patients. I'm like, have you discuss this with your doctor? Have you discussed this with your psychiatrist? Like, no, I'm afraid to. I mentioned it once and they just shot me down. So I really think educating doctors and facilitating communication between doctors and patients is the most important thing that we have going forward. You could save lives by doing that. Yeah, absolutely. So you mentioned earlier this term, the endocannabinoid system, and I, I just want to quickly, for those who don't know, can you explain what the endocannabinoid system is, how it works, and why it is so important that it be taught in more medical schools? Right. Well, there's a neurotransmitter system that cannabis hijacks and utilizes in our brain. You know, there are all kinds of neurotransmitters. There's like the epinephrine system and, you know, the opiate system, the endo, you know, endorphins, but there's actually a 
a neurotransmitter system in our brains that's really specific to cannabis. And it regulates all kinds of things in our bodies, like all the most critical things like memory, learning, attention, appetite, behavior, mood, temperature, reproduction. And because of the war on drugs, this whole neurotransmitter system, which still regulates our brains, regardless of whether you're pro or anti-cannabis, needs to be taught and learned in medical school. I mean, there's such incredible drug development in this system all over the world. And it's just really sad because the American doctors hardly know anything about it. And medical students are grumbling that they're not learning about it. So there are two problems. One, that they're not teaching this really critical neurotransmitter system, which they discovered about 30 years ago. It's newly discovered in medical schools. And two, they're just not teaching anything helpful about cannabis in medical schools. And, you know, all the surveys show medical students are complaining that they're, they're not learning anything helpful in medical school. And then they go into practice and all the patients are asking them about it. <laughs> Why not educate the doctors so that they could be helpful and part of the solution, not part of the problem? So I'd like to talk a little more granular detail about your book. I was reading through some of the chapters and there were a couple in there that were, shall we say, controversial. <laughs> <laughs> but in every single chapter, you look at the evidence, you've got sort of citations, you know, and you highlight when it says things like this may be a side effect or, you know, you really break down how to read through medical papers for people and you make it logical and easy to understand. There were a couple of chapters that really interested me and I wanted to know what you could pull is the truth from all of this study so far about cannabis and psychosis and then cannabis and addiction. Well, those were two really challenging chapters. I, I can't even tell you how much time I spent on them, like infinite. Like it feels like I spent more time than I've even been alive working on each of those chapters because it's <laughs> very nuanced and complex. Now, psychosis, cannabis does cause psychosis. It, it can cause a transient drug-induced psychosis, just like amphetamines can, steroids can, hallucinogens can. It usually goes away. Cannabis does not increase the risk of schizophrenia. That is absolute nonsense. The rates of schizophrenia no. have been flat out stable at about 1% for the last 50 years. And the worldwide cannabis use has gone from like 10,000 people to like 400 million people. And the rates of schizophrenia have been flat. Like they're trying so hard mm -hmm. to prove that they've budged up, but they haven't. It's literally impossible for the rates of schizophrenia to be flat with us going from like cannabis use in the tens of thousands to the hundreds of millions and the rates not going up. What cannabis yeah. can do is it can precipitate a psychotic illness like schizophrenia earlier. So it's certainly not harm free. Like if you're going to get schizophrenia, it's much better to get it later after you've developed life skills than earlier, you know, when you're still forming as a young adult, your coping skills and your friendships and your adult behaviors. So that is a harm of cannabis that it precipitates psychosis earlier. And then in people who are psychotic, it could destabilize them. So definitely... Mm -hmm. One of the things you want to ask before you start someone, for example, on medical marijuana is, have you ever had any psychosis, any psychotic reactions, any family history of schizophrenia? Because what it really comes down to is, again, cannabis doesn't raise the rates of psychosis or schizophrenia, I should say, doesn't raise the rates of schizophrenia, but it can trigger it if you have a family history. If you don't have a family history, it doesn't seem to increase your risk of getting schizophrenia or precipitate it early. The problem is people don't know their family histories. Some people are adopted, mental illness is stigmatized. Sometimes people never talked about grandpa was off, but no one really knew what was wrong with him. You know, so people don't really know their family histories. But so I'd say that, yes, it can cause psychosis. That's one of the harms of cannabis. Much more likely to do so if we use huge doses of THC and if we don't use CBD. CBD is very protective. It's antipsychotic. So, you know, the older medicinal versions, which had THC and CBD, which I recommend, most medical cannabis doctors do, are less likely to provoke psychosis. And then you just have to screen patients carefully. And then if there's any signs of any psychotic symptoms, you, cannabis is is no longer an option, you know, at least for like yeah. until the patient's stabilized for like several years. Now about addiction is really complicated. People can get addicted to cannabis. There's no question. I treat people for cannabis addiction. It could be miserable and it could really undermine all of their life goals and make them really, really unhappy. 
is not the same as opiate addiction, which I'm 15 years personally in recovery from. And like nobody smashes into pharmacies or like breaks bones to get cannabis like they do with opiates. It's not like as all consuming and addiction, but you can get addicted to it. The problem is that the psychiatrists and the addiction people define cannabis use disorder so broadly. And I go through all the different reasons why they did that. Is it financial? Is it ideological? Is it just pure cluelessness? Is it OFS, the dreaded old fart syndrome? Or why they did that? <laughs> but we included things like cravings, tolerance, withdrawal. Where with opiates, if someone's on medical opiate therapy, you don't consider that you don't count those towards addiction because everybody has tolerance and withdrawal. And just those two yeah. are enough to give you a definition of a diagnosis of cannabis use disorder. I mean, that means every single medical opiate user would be addicted to opiates if we use the same criteria for opiates as we do for cannabis. And so by using cravings, tolerance, and withdrawal, those three categories, and again, you only need two to qualify as having cannabis use disorder or cannabis addiction, they rope in all of the medical patients. It's absolutely ridiculous. So the fact is some people get very, very addicted to cannabis, not nearly as many as the psychiatrists say, and we're just doing a huge disservice to people by diagnosing them with a stigmatizing condition. I mean, I go over this in the book, all the harms that come from giving someone a diagnosis of an addiction that they don't have. And then finally, cannabis is very complicated. The psychiatrists tend to look at things as like you are intoxicated versus you are not intoxicated, whereas cannabis has all these benefits. It does help people with anxiety, with creativity, understanding art and music, with their sex lives, connecting to others or their quality of life. So cannabis often, you come into a clinical situation where it's like helping them and hurting them. They are sort of addicted, but it's also filling some needs. So mm -hmm. it's very important or how you can fill those needs the cannabis is filling if the cannabis is harming them, not just say they're intoxicated. Like it's a very complicated and nuanced effect with pros and cons, with all kinds of benefits for people. So I think that if they had a deeper understanding of what cannabis does for people, they'd understand much better how to get people off of cannabis. And then the final thing, talking about addiction, you can't talk about addiction without talking about the immense potential of CBD to get people off all kinds of other drugs and cannabis per yeah. se. A lot of people use it to get off alcohol, to get off opiates. Uh, it's a whole complicated discussion about the ways in which it is and isn't safe to use cannabis for opiate use disorder. I go through that in detail in my book, but suffice it to say that people are considering it a gateway out of addiction, not a gateway into addiction, which was the old propaganda point, which has been pretty thoroughly debunked. Yeah, and you and I have had a discussion before as two people in recovery who have found cannabis help them move away from more harmful substances. Cannabis has been nothing helpful to my recovery. I mean, most people yeah, are afraid same. to say that, but it, most doctors would never say that. But I can just say it's been 100% helpful to my recovery. Yeah, I'd say the same thing. What do you think is the most exaggerated harm and what do you think is the most exaggerated benefit since you've been looking at the polar ends of the, the spectrum when it comes to the views on cannabis? Well, the most exaggerated benefit is easy. Cannabis does not cure cancer Tech uh -huh. that we know of right now. It does yeah. kill cancer cells in the lab and in some animal studies, but that does not mean that it translates into humans. So people who use like Rick Simpson oil, there are a lot of anecdotal stories about how it cured this cancer and that cancer. And there's some very credible people I know that have used Rick Simpson oil and have done really well. But doctors can't and won't and shouldn't be advocating for cannabis as a cure for cancer because it just hasn't been shown in humans to cure cancer. We're going to keep studying this. This might be different in 10 years. It's incredibly helpful for the symptoms, both of cancer, the pain, the insomnia, the anxiety, and the symptoms of chemotherapy, as I saw with my brother Danny, the nausea, the vomiting, the fatigue, the despair. So it's phenomenally helpful for cancer patients, but it does not cure cancer per se. Mm -hmm. And again, we're going to keep studying that. But right now, you anybody who's saying that is, is acting irresponsibly. In terms of the most, there's so many fears that have been of cannabis that have been blown out of proportion. That's almost impossible to say. Yeah. I think, you know, the one that bothers me the most is, and this again goes to what we talked about earlier, the amotivational syndrome. Like my dad, cannabis scholar, like one of the smartest people ever on cannabis, he tended to think of cannabis as like an enhancer, like it made motivated people more motivated and it might make less motivated people less motivated. But hmm. I tend to think 
more of, you know, it has a lot to do with privilege and your circumstances. And, you know, a lot of the studies were such nonsense. They'd study these like really poor disadvantaged people and say, aha, they smoke cannabis and they did, you know, more poorly on standardized tests. Look at how poorly motivated they are and what low IQs. And it's like, yeah, poor people do worse on standardized tests. We know that. That doesn't mean it's the cannabis. The cannabis is probably making their miserable lives a little bit less miserable as they try to walk through each day. (laughs) But the whole amotivational syndrome, I just haven't seen it. We certainly all see some patients, friends, family members. We've seen people that get stuck on cannabis and do seem very like they're stuck in life. But I don't think that's the cannabis. I think the cannabis is just as plausibly a symptom of whatever they're going through as a cause. And I think they're just associated. And as we know, association does not equate to causation. And I just see cannabis having an incredibly motivating effect on like, I mean, I've dealt with like thousands of cannabis users, like, I don't know, I shouldn't say that, but starting in junior high school, high school, college, growing up, medical school, the five years I spent in Greenpeace before medical school, and just as a cannabis clinician and a cannabis advocate, and, you know, for large parts of my life, a cannabis user. And I haven't seen the slightest iota of evidence that it makes people amotivational. And I've seen like spectacular evidence that it makes people like very enthusiastic and motivated. Some people for music, some people for art, some people just to like be a better person, some people for exercise, some people for writing. So I think the amotivational syndromes like just like simply was a fever dream of the U.S. war on drugs that they found was effective to scare yeah. people, but I don't think there's anything to it. And anybody that still cites the amotivational syndrome, to me, that click immediately makes me think, this person doesn't know what they're talking about. That might sound a little bit judgmental, but it's just because you asked me <laughs> what I thought the most outlandish anti-cannabis claim has been. And I think that it's been so yeah. thoroughly debunked that if someone's still talking about how it makes you amotivational, they're either at coming from a very narrow and cloistered vantage point, like they just take care of the train wrecks. They don't have like a, which are very serious cases that I, I help with too and have a lot of empathy for, but it doesn't teach you about cannabis. It's sort of like, you know, saying the only thing about opiates is the overdoses. No, it also helps people with pain and improves their quality of life. Like you have to look at all of a drug, not just one tiny little vantage point. So I would say that is the, the cannabis myth that is sort of most egregious. That's interesting. I did not expect you to say that. What did you expect? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. There's been so many exaggerated harms <laughs> of cannabis. Well, the dropping sperm crowd, the growing yeah. breasts, the DNA damage. I wasn't counting the stuff that like any sane physician of the last 20 years no longer believed. I was like sort of discounting <laughs> the stuff yeah. from the past that they unfortunately used to scare a lot of people that none of which turned out to be true. Yeah. You said that you learned quite a lot about autism during the research for this book. What do you think was the topic that you learned the most on? Well, autism, what I learned was really interesting. Most of the studies are animal studies. And a lot of the human studies are just starting with mostly CBD and just a little bit of THC because people are afraid to give too much THC to kids for fear that it might harm their brains. Of course, they're giving these heavy duty antipsychotics. They're giving them Adderall. They're giving them antidepressants. Like who's to say that any of this other stuff they're giving these poor kids is better for you than cannabis. Like I can't even imagine Adderall, take a 10 year old that you'd say Adderall is better than THC for the 10 year old, but Mm -hmm. it's just a question of what we're used to and what the drug companies have sort of promulgated versus what we've been conditioned against by the U.S. government. But autism and childhood epilepsy have a huge overlap. And we see how effective CBD is for these epilepsy syndromes. And there's thought to be similar sort of mechanisms involved. And they think one of the deficits in autism is that of oxytocin, the hormone that makes you connect with people and communicate. And, you know, when you hug or, you know, just a handshake or a smile, you get oxytocin and it's like a pro-social hormone. And that's Mm -hmm. all mediated by the endocannabinoid system. And then they noticed lower oxytocin in people with with autism and lower endocannabinoids. And then the studies so far, which again, are not like the most conclusive studies, but the human studies are starting to show not only the cannabis helps with the non-core symptoms of autism, like violent repetitive behaviors or anxiety. A lot of the behaviors they give these heavy duty antipsychotics or stimulants for, which again, can't possibly be that much worse than cannabis, if worse at all. But cannabis was thought to be helping with the core symptoms, the connection between with their parents and with other people and their language and their ability to, to relate to other people. And if you have a medication that might be helping 
the core symptoms of autism, which of course is like the cruelest part of it, you know, just finding a way to connect with with these kids that don't have the right hormone levels. Again, I'm really astounded that with the evidence that we have so far, they're not flooding research into studying this. And again, it yeah. might not be just CBD or THC. It might be a different drug working through the endocannabinoid system, but they should be looking at this completely like without any reservation. And I'm just a little bit surprised how, you know, the pro, the cannabis doctors that treat kids are like, this is great. It works. The pediatricians are like, this doesn't work at all. We're not interested. And again, autism is a perfect example of how there are two camps. And the truth is probably somewhere in between, and we should be studying it all with an open mind. And that just really speaks to how essential it is to learn about the endocannabinoid system in general to start to understand human health on a different level, because it's like understanding a whole new system of the body and just not teaching it to doctors. It doesn't seem like the way forward with medical research. So <laughs> I guess this is a very broad question, but what is your hope with this book? Are you hoping for this to sort of spread the word just to folks who are interested? Are you hoping to change the way that that medical schools work? Uh, yes, I would say both. It was meant to be like the third book in a series, the first two that my dad wrote. The first one was Marijuana Reconsidered in 1971, and the second was Marijuana, the Forbidden Medicine in 1993. And it was meant to be like a fresh view of the actual data, and not just the data with a capital D, the data with a small d, the real world data, the patient registries, the surveys, all the kind of stuff that's been just discounted by the government. And to really try to bring people together on the same page, because neither side has a monopoly on the truth. I mean, I sort of side with the anti people on a couple of things here and there. And it's really certainly not missed. It's certainly not intended just for pro cannabis people. It's really intended for everybody, because I really do my best. And I've even had communication with people that I very much disagree with about cannabis, disagree with, but respect. And I've run things by them. And I'm like, is this an accurate depiction of like the argument against cannabis? So I've actually run it by people who are very anti. And I feel like I do a pretty good job of, of representing both sides. I mean, the thing about cannabis is that everybody has an opinion and everybody has a bias. So I admit my bias, you know, at the very beginning, I'd say it helped my brother. It helps my patients. Of course, I'm going to tend to be in favor, but then I ask everybody to put their biases to the side. And I'm just mm -hmm. asking for people to, with an open mind, take a, a fresh look at this issue because we're always bombarded by contradictory messages. And what I'm trying to do is really give people a way to think about it that's very evidence-based, but also very tangible and practical and a way to help people move forward so there's less acrimony. And then ideally, if we can get our act together and have less fighting on this issue, maybe that could provide a blueprint for working together on other issues because you know we need to start working together the way things are going it is not looking good for planet earth so i just think the more we could tone down the polarization and the acrimony and get in the same page and if we could do this in something as polarized and politicized as cannabis maybe we could do this on other things i love your optimism dr grinspoon and i hope that you're right your new book, Seeing Through the Smoke, A Cannabis Specialist Untangles the Truth About Marijuana, is out on 420, 2023, the perfect 420 book. It's looking at the origins and assessing the validity of the claims about what cannabis can and can't do. It's smart. It's funny. It's a very interesting read. And you can check out an excerpt of it before it publishes in the Different Leaf Winter Issue, which is available at differentleaf.com. Dr. Grinspoon, thank you so much for joining me. Always a pleasure to talk to you. Always a pleasure. I look forward to the next one. This seems to be a ritual. I, I hope it continues, yeah. A huge thanks to this episode's guest, Dr. Peter Grinspoon, author of the new book, Seeing Through the Smoke, A Cannabis Specialist Untangles the Truth About Marijuana, which drops on 420. Remember to grab yourself a copy of the Winter 2023 issue of Different Leaf the magazine to get a sneak peek at Dr. Grinspoon's book on page 44. Also, be sure to like and subscribe to the show wherever you're listening to us right now and follow us on social media at Different Leaf and I'm on social media at Brit the British. Check out differentleaf.com for all the issues of our magazine. The latest one is our beautiful winter issue all about medical marijuana. The magazine is available at differentleaf.com and on thousands of shelves across the US and Canada at select Barnes & Noble bookstores, CVS pharmacies, Walmarts, and select cannabis dispensaries. That's differentleaf.com.